we have Vincette from Purdue speaking to us on unveiling the complexities of rotating detonation physics with advanced megahertz rate laser diagnostics. He is currently a research scientist and he received his PhD from Purdue in 2021, um, working on detonation physics in rotating detonation engines under the advisement of Dr. Terrence Myers. And currently he is a staff scientist at Purdue Zucru Laboratories. Um, where he's continuing to work on RDE um, efforts for diagnostics. And with that, I will give him the floor and let him share his screen. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, I'm just gonna take a minute here. All right, so. Okay, does everybody see my presenter view or? Oops. Uh, right now we see the presenter view. Okay, uh, just one second. And yeah, now it's good. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, and thanks for the introduction, Rachel. Uh, so I'm a staff scientist. My name is Venkat Atmanan. I work at the university. Uh, so we've been working for the last uh, three and a half years or so, uh, working on uh, developing advanced diagnostics for rotating detonation engines and trying to understand how these physics differ from uh, what we've studied, you know, from a 2D detonation standpoint. Um, the the work that I'm going to present here is mostly uh, uh, consists of the work that I did during my PhD days, and then some of the work extensions that we've done uh, just for fun to understand what what we're seeing in RDEs. With that said, uh, this is the roadmap for today's talk. So I'm gonna be talking about why we need to study RDEs, what is the motivation for doing RDE work, uh, and then we'll go over combined experimental and numerical approach that we've picked uh, in the last three years or so. Uh, and it, this is a work that consists from a lot of people from like staff, scientists, to postdocs, to different various professors working on experiments as well as the numerical side. Uh, then we'll dive into the physics of uh, rotating detonations. Uh, and then we'll try to see what uh, what are the underlying physics that influence rotating detonations, and we will then extend that understanding into a few different geometries uh, from a ramp to a premixed RDE, and we'll then conclude broadly of what those coupled physics are all about. The picture you see here uh, on the top is is a methane oxygen. Uh, detonation, protein detonation rocket engine, and the same RDE can be converted into a hydrogen air RDE. So it's a versatile platform that we're working with. With that, let's go to the motivation in the background. So why RDEs? Uh, everybody is aware that, you know, you can increase thermodynamic cycle efficiency uh, using detonative combustion. Uh, this is adapted from Heiser and Pratt. You can see that the detonation cycle actually has a larger area under the curve for the same uh, pressure ratio. And what that means is you'd be able to get more work output. The picture on the right here was provided courtesy of Professor Braun. Uh, and this is an actual compressor coupled to a turbine, coupled to a supersonic, uh, uh, actual, com actual compressor coupled to an RDC, which is coupled to a supersonic turbine. So let's kind of understand with a few numbers on what we're talking about in terms of performance or uh, thermal efficiency gains. So if you assume a pressure ratio of 30 and the ambient temperature of the air coming in to be at 300 Kelvin, uh, your compressor at 30 uh, bar would be outputting total temperature of about 800 Kelvin. So if you just go through the Brayton cycle, uh, you know, thermal efficiency formula, you get about 62% if you assume a constant uh, pressure combustion system. If you assume a constant volume combustion system, that 1800 Kelvin actually jumps to a T0, T0 three of 2000 Kelvin, which gives you a 67% increase in thermal efficiency. You, you, you're, you're, if you go back and plug in that same formula here and you want to see what is the pressure ratio that I need in order to achieve that additional thermal efficiency, you're basically looking to increase the pressure ratio from 30 to 50, which is like over a 75% increase than what you had before. So, you know, RDCs are a way in which the combustion process itself can pr provide a little bit of shock compression to the flow, which allows you to actually extract more work from the same uh, propellants. So, 
the ad another second advantage is it's kind of quasi uh, constant volume. What that means is uh, you don't have to actually have a confinement in order to actually achieve constant volume combustion. So this is a continuous flow device. Uh, we've already talked about thermodynamic uh, efficiency increase and the shock compression can provide uh, uh, some elite, uh, from from some some leeway into like uh, the compressor load. So you don't have to actually have a high high pressure combust uh, compressor. You can actually lower your compressor loads and actually improve the thermodynamic efficiency of the cycle. And a uh, few other advantages are it's it's low in weight and it produces a compact flame with very high combustion intensity, which is heat release per unit volume. So that kind of motivates why we want to do RDEs and we want to transition away from Brayton cycles, which are prevalent in gas turbine engines as well as rocket engines. So uh, some background. Uh, so we have had a significant body of uh, fundamental straight channel detonations and they've informed like various characteristics. Uh, some of the experimental work has been listed here. Uh, I'll try to use my pointer. So the experimental work has been uh, listed here from like, you know, 2005 all the way to 2023 as recent as a few months ago. Uh, most of these experimental work has been done on a 2D premix detonation channel, typically a square cross section. So the media is quiescent and um, you can also consider the media's, uh, the, the detonation wave is propagating through a media which has um, uh, uh, properties that are well-defined. So we're able to study what the fundamental characteristics of detonation are, you know, what is the cellular structure, how much reactant is leaking. For example, this particular image over here is an OH PLIF uh, image that was taken by uh, Austin and Pinjin uh, uh, in 2005. It's one of the famous images that we all know about detonations. And you can superimpose that with the Schlieren, which is the pressure uh, uh, wave. So the pressure wave and the combustion wave can be superimposed on top of each other to kind of get an idea of how the shock flame coupling occurs. Uh, we can also understand things like oblique detonation waves where the oblique shock or the shock pressure is provided by an external flow. And then you introduce fuel and you start to set up detonation waves and cellular instabilities along that surface. So that's an oblique detonation wave. Uh, and again, in this case, the static properties and the inflow conditions are very well characterized and very well known. Uh, and here's another image of an OH PLIF study that was recently done on the sensitivity of OH PLIF to detonations because of the fact that there is a large pressure gradient, what happens to the OH PLIF signal? Uh, and so this, this is again a fundamental study and that kind of gives us an idea of if I'm looking at an OH PLIF image, what are all the considerations that I have to have? And again, the last thing over here is a recent work by Mark Frederick where uh, he used um, uh, ultra-fast diagnostics to understand how cellular propagation occurs uh, in, 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 a, in a methane oxygen flame and a hydrogen oxygen flame. And then he extended using advanced current generation laser diagnostics to get cellular structures because earlier this could be done only by soot foil. So fundamental understanding like this actually provides us an ability to take this framework and try to see what happens in the RDE. With that said, All right, so what about RDEs? What are, the, what are the challenges with respect to RDEs? Uh, so the first and foremost challenge is that the reactant is non-quiescent. So the characterization uh, that we were able to do earlier is no longer available because along that axial length, your, your, your properties are changing, changing. Your static properties are changing. Your, um, your local equivalence ratio is changing. And it, this is changing in all three dimensions ahead of the detonation wave in the axial, azimuthal, as well as the radial direction. The second challenge that we are talking about is wall curvature effects, because of the fact that this wave is now propagating through a curved channel, you start to see effects like you see over here, where the detonation wave is now setting off a bunch of oblique shocks because of the variations in the radial direction. Um, and you also have a product gas, mixing with the reactants, which can kind of flame hold and uh, increase the temperature of the reactants and make it uh, different than what you'd get from a, a straight channel detonation, which is kind of shown here by Takama Sato et al's CFD work. Uh, you also have product gas relief in all three directions. So if you took, think about a straight channel detonation, the wave has to travel from left to right and it's only propagating through quiescent reactants and the product gases are all confined to the dimension behind the detonation wave. There's no way the product gas can go ahead of the detonation. But 
in an RDE, you don't have that constraint. You're able to relieve pressure both in the actual direction, which happens quite often, as you can see here. You can also relieve pressure in the radial direction, which you see here. And you also can relieve in the azimuth direction, which you see in behind the detonation wave. So, so you have product gas relief in all three directions, which also has an influence on uh, the way these systems behave compared to what you get from a traditional uh, uh, detonation system. Uh, and typically, uh, outside of the flow physics, the diagnostics has been quite challenging as well. And one of the reasons is the, the fact that you have a curved wall. Once you start having a curved wall, you start to put optical windows, you will start to like warp the image. So how do you get around that? And what are all the corrections you need to do before you're able to make some useful conclusions? The second challenge is most of these measurements have to be made at least at 100 kilohertz or above. So solid state lasers, uh, typically their, their limitations are on the order of 10 to 20 kilohertz, which means that a, a, a large chunk of measurement capabilities that we've developed for studying constant pressure combustion systems are no longer readily applicable. So we'll have to come up with new diagnostics to be able to do that. Which is why a lot of the performance characterization has been done using like pressure transducers, thrust measurements, and computational fluid dynamics. But the, the, the fact that there is a lot of coupled physics that I described earlier, uh, which makes it difficult to highlight, you know, one particular causal effect. So you usually end up with several different hypotheses. And uh, in fact, uh, my, my goal for this talk is to motivate uh, the couple physics problem, which makes RD super sensitive to different aspects. So we need both measurements and computational effects combined, uh, computational uh, calculations combined to understand what uh, RDEs are doing. So with that said, I'm going to introduce our combined experimental and numerical approach. So this is our uh, RDE test platform. We named it THOR, which is stand, stands for Turbine Integrated High Pressure Optical RDE. So it's a modular injection scheme. Um, it's a non-premixed RDE for the most part. Air comes in from left to right. As you can see here, it goes through a choke point and it meets hydrogen jets, 100 hydrogen jets, which are milled with individual slots. They're like tiny holes. And it's in a traditional jet and cross flow arrangement so that we are able to use some of the traditional jet and cross flow um, mathematics to understand what that flow field could look like. Uh, the RDE has an inner, uh, inner diameter of 114 millimeters. The channel gap is 10.7 millimeters. And the RDE is about 95 millimeters wide, long, actually. Uh, there is a 10 degree expansion angle on the inlet side. And on the exit side, that angle is maintained until an area ratio of 1.85. After that, it jumps into a sudden uh, backward facing step, which then expands out into an area ratio of seven. And as you go further along near the exhaust, you go to an exhaust ratio of 10.9. That additional expansion in the radial direction is done to integrate a supersonic turbine, but that will not be a part of this talk. The fuel and the oxidizer combination, as I mentioned before, is hydrogen air. And we designed this RDE in such a way that we can actually get optical access all the way from the air plenum till the exhaust. And the reason we want to do that is a lot of computational work and uh, experimental pressure measurements have shown that there's a lot of coupling between the detonation wave and the plenum. So if you have an optical access, at least to the oxidizer side, because the oxidizer mass flux is typically much higher than the fuel mass flux for most combustors, both be it in the rocket or in the air breathing case. It made, it made most sense to actually try to put the air in the optical axis. And so we, we got the optical axis extended into the air plenum or the ox plenum in this case. And we, we wanted to be able to understand if there is any product gas backflow or understand how any of these coupled physics work with the air plenum. Now that's the optical configuration. We have a second configuration where we can remove the squartz, slap on a instrument in outer body, and we can start to install pressure transducers in multiple locations. That's a typo. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the correct numbers a little bit. But uh, it's, it's 15 and 60 millimeters roughly. In any event, uh, we have PCBs put in the air plenum, which is corresponding to this location, injection near field, mid field, and far field. These PCB sensors are flush mounted. 
and they are thermally uh, corrected for the drift. So most of the data that I'm presenting in this work will be limited before it reaches thermal saturation. Now I have four different mass flux cases that I'll be discussing in this talk. As you can see, the global equivalence ratio is maintained around 1.07 uh, with uh, variant, variance of around 0.02. So most of the physics we get here uh, will be hopefully purely dependent on the mass flux of the air. And case number two, we consider it to be a baseline case because most of this talk will focus on that baseline case, both computationally and experimentally. Uh, the next step we'll look at is the CFD domain and the computer setup. Uh, first and foremost, I got to uh, provide uh, thanks to Dr. James Braun, who has been with us since the inception of this project. So as the hardware was getting built, the computational domains were getting built by Dr. Braun and his team. Uh, so he built this computational domain, which is a not which which simulates the RD more or less one to one. Uh, so it's a non premixed uh, simulation. The solver we, we used was CFT++ supplied from Metacom. I've listed some parameters here. Uh, so it's a K-Mega SSD turbulence model. Uh, you can see here that the boundary layer uh, is resolved using grid meshing. Uh, and then we experimentally supply the test conditions to the CFD. What that means is we'll first do the experiments and then supply the inlet and the exit conditions to the CFD in order to actually match it more or less one-to-one. -one. So it's a structured grid, which uses 45 million cells. And the reaction chemistry here uh, we're using is a one-step reaction model with hydrogen, oxygen, what that hydrogen, oxygen, water, and nitrogen. So what that means is nitrogen will not partake in the reaction. And we don't have any uh, um, intermediate species like hydroxyl radicals. So we will have to like compare it with some other metric like total temperature. Uh, some of the dominant uh, 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 results at the baseline condition, here's a here's a beautiful CFT that uh, shows the static temperature variations over time. Uh, so mostly the detonation cycle frequency reaches uh, close to ninety percent of the value of what you get in the experiments, and the wave morphology also globally, even the locally is, is a little different. Globally seems to capture a good chunk of the features that we see in the experiments. Next up. We're going to talk about the diagnostics that we, we're going to be presenting in this work. So uh, the first thing that I want to mention is the fact that the, the timing diagram is shown here for one very reason is to say that we first prime the system with fuel and oxidizer. And then we initiate a pre-detonated charge. And that charge starts the RDE at T0. And we do our diagnostics measurements at about 300 milliseconds post starting the RDE. What that means is the RDE has reached limit cycle. So any measurement we do is going to be very similar over time, as long as we're doing that measurement during the steady state operation. Now, there are cases where the system could be unstable. Then that means that that particular test run is unstable. But the conditions that we focused on in this talk are all stable cases. So any image or any detonation uh, uh, phase average image that I'm showing are all during the steady state operation. So the morphology and the way physics should be maintained. So the second aspect is we're going to use hydroxyl radical and bank on hydroxyl radical heavily throughout the stock. The flame uh, and, and the way we do that is the hydroxyl radical can be used as uh, for two things. For it could be used as a flame front marker or it could be used as a marker for product gas. And so we take benefit of the fact that the natural chemiluminescence you get from hydroxyl radical is going to be used as a flame front marker. And the way we do that is actually by reducing the exposure down to 100 nanoseconds. So whatever OH star chemiluminescence you see within 100 nanoseconds will be preferentially from the detonation wave and the leading front of the detonation wave. That's the hope. And the second aspect is OH star is usually present at about 1500 Kelvin or above. Uh, OH, on the other hand, can be present at temperatures as low as 900 Kelvin and above. So OH will be used for marking the product gas. So one of them is used for giving the wave shape, which is the flame front, and the other one is used for marking the product gas, which is where all have the products from the detonation wave gone to. And so the OH PLIF and the OH star chemiluminescence are both done at a megahertz repetition rate. Uh, the OH star chemiluminescence has an exposure of 100 nanosecond, as I mentioned before. And the OH PLIF uh, is done at 284 nanometers for the Q19 um, uh, OH radical transition. 
the laser is about five nanoseconds wide. Uh, the laser pulse is about 300 microjoules per pulse, and we get about 122 pulses per experiment. Uh, and the camera that we're using is exposed, the camera and the intensifier combination we're using is only exposed to 40 nanoseconds. One other thing that I didn't mention uh, in detail, you can read about this in, uh, in our paper, uh, is, is the fact that we actually had to uh, uh, couple a burst mode laser, which provides a pulse train uh, of like short, very high energy, but extremely short duration, about 10 milliseconds, but you can get a lot of pulses at about a megahertz if you want repetition rate. We couple that burst mode laser into an optical parametric oscillator. What that does is it takes these fundamental wavelengths off light at uh, 532 and 355, and then goes through a bunch of nonlinear optical processes and provides us with 284 nanometer. That all happens in our laser lab, and that's about 20 feet away. And then we pass the beam and we catch the beam at the experiment 20 feet later, use shape forming optics, and actually image uh, the OH blip. The OH star chemiluminescence and the OH plif are simultaneous and orthogonal. What I mean by that is the cameras are actually synchronized with each other. So every time the camera is actually exposed, they're actually capturing uh, an, a snapshot of OH star and a snapshot of OH plif. The OH plif is going to give you the radial axial Rx direction. The OH star chemiluminescence is going to give you the wave shape in the theta X direction. We've not done any spatial transformations. These are all real images. And the good thing about OH plif is that it actually goes through two curved surfaces. So at this particular angle that we picked for the curvature of the RDE that we have, uh, we actually can just point a camera straight at the uh, plif plane and it'll actually de-warp it back. The, the object plane will get like transformed back because of the curved surfaces. So we actually don't have to you know, go through a whole bunch of uh, um, uh, transformation analysis in this particular case. Okay, so that's the that's two of the three measurements. And the third measurement is also an OH flip measurement, but this time, instead of the OH flip giving you the XR direction, we've now chosen to do the R theta direction at two different Xs. So we take that 284 nanometer beam, split it into two, form two sheets, and we actually want to see what happens in the injecting near field and the far field. And what does our camera see? It kind of sees this. That's what the camera sees. So we're able to like close down the aperture and still get you know OH plif images at those two planes. So we can do simultaneous dual plane OH plif. So those are all the measurements. Uh, next up, we'll go to the experimental results. So let's look at a few research questions. Uh, the first one is like, what does a wave look like? Uh, can we, because of the fact that we're doing you know measurements in the X theta, XR, and R theta, all three directions, are we able to get a three-dimensional morphology? Uh, questions like reactant stratification and static properties that we discussed earlier. Uh, and then does that backward facing step do anything at all? Does it actually like, you know, pilot a flame? And then is that product gas and that trapped backward facing step actually interacting with the reactants that are above it? Uh, so those kind of questions are all like some of the key research questions. And the reason we want to think about these things is these coupled effects actually will, at the end of the day, affect the performance of a rotating detonation. If you're expecting it to actually provide a certain combustion efficiency, and you go through uh, and you don't understand what any of these processes are doing, then we're going to have a challenge with respect to optimizing our needs. So with that said, we're going to dive into the morphology of the detonation wave. So what I mean by that is I'm going to show OH star chemiluminescence images. All right, there we go. So uh, this is at that baseline condition that I talked about. So the G of the air throat is 750 kilograms per meter square per second. And then you can use the area ratio to get the, uh, the, the various uh, mass flux in the, in the chamber. It's, it's part of a uh, seventh of that. Uh, the global equivalence ratio is around 1.07. Uh, the field of view that you see is basically kind of marked here. So you can kind of see that you're able to see upstream of the air injection plenum, some of the fuel holes through the entire combustor and a little bit of the, of the wave as it's going around the RDE. Uh, this is OH star imaging. Uh, there is a paper by Sheffer et al, which kind of discusses what are all the emissions you get from a hydrogen air flame. Uh, the OH emission that you get is actually eight orders of magnitude higher than the, hydro, uh, the, the water in the blue continuum. So all of this is actually scaled eight times to that of, uh, it, it's actually bumped up or multiplied by eight in order to normalize and show what they look like. So any emission we see 
should be primarily OHR and nothing else. Um, and our camera and the intensifier combination spectral sensitivity range kind of cuts off at about 750. So again, what we see is OH and more or less nothing else. There's no hot water or anything else that we're seeing. The, the, the exposure is set to 100 nanoseconds so that we can preferentially capture the detonation frame. And within that 100 nanoseconds, the wave moves like 160 microns. So it's kind of frozen in frame because we're looking at like 20 millimeters. That's the scale, right? A movement of a few microns is not going to be actually affected. So whatever you see there is what you get. Uh, the recording time is 256 microseconds, and that's a limitation of the camera system that we have. It's a Shimatsu HPBX2. And the image that you're looking at is, um, is not, has not been transformed. It's just raw image. Flow goes always from left to right in this entire talk. So what are all the key observations? So the first thing is that we see a departure in the detonation wave structure from canonical detonations in a premixed channel or even you know, a premixed um, um, rotating detonation in, a, in, a, in, a, in an unwrapped channel. So both those things combined, we actually, uh, the, the, the detonation we see here is actually quite different. So I'm going to pause it at this frame. And the next thing is we also see actual variations in the detonation structure. So in the injection near field, it's kind of weak. And then in the far field, it's much stronger. And so that is a significant actual variation. And this actual variation is not uh, uh, akin to what you would see uh, because of cellular propagation, but this is more a consistent system. We also see that there is a trailing combustion wave. And the reason why I say that is a trailing combustion wave is because we remember kept the exposure at 100 nanoseconds. So whatever you see here is coming from a very high luminous combustion front. So yes, we see a trailing combustion wave. And we also looked at this from the pressure standpoint where we put up PCB notionally at like the injection near field. About 14 millimeters and then the injection far field at about 73 millimeters. And at the injection near field, as the wave crosses that PCB, two features, A and B, pop up one after the other. And the spatial separation with respect to the wave speed will give you a temporal separation. And these two correlate quite well. So we have a conversion of claim paper that kind of goes over the, the exact numbers. Um, but in the downstream section where uh, the, or, or the injection far field, we actually see a monotonic pressure drop. So there is no trailing combustion wave, and therefore there is no trailing pressure, pressure peak that we see. So let's not try to go use the URAN simulation to kind of understand and interpret the results to see why we see what we see. All right, so on the left, you see the instantaneous snapshot of the wave, and on the right, you have URAN's uh, radial slide radial actual slices at an azimuth position right ahead of the detonation wave, at about three to four degrees ahead of the detonation wave. So there are three things that we plot here. Uh, so you have your Mach number, that's at the hydrogen jet site. And then you have local equivalence ratio, which um, shows uh, at a hydrogen site and in between two hydrogen sites. So if you have pure air coming in and then there is hydrogen in between, what does that the reactant stream look like. So let's demarcate the system visually. So zone one is low luminosity because it's unmixed. It has low static properties and it has lower chemiluminescence compared to what you see in zone two. And in zone two, the product gases are relatively well, the reactant gases are relatively well mixed and you have higher static pressures and higher chemiluminescence because of that. And that is correspondingly observed in the uran simulation where the Mach number in the injection near field is like close to two. And then suddenly it starts to expand out and drop in Mach number. That's, that's the characteristic of a supersonic free jet. And once it drops to like subsonic regime in the far field, which we call zone two, at those locations, you can start to see more amenable local equivalence ratio. Here it's too fuel rich or in between sites, it's too fuel lean. And in the far field, it starts to show a better mixed reactant stream. And we, yeah, we observe the trailing combustion right behind zone one. So this is starting to piece together a story of uh, what's happening here. And, 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 and the fact that the static properties are low and the mixing is poor could be explanations for why we see a trailing combustion wave. Um, 
we also see this zone bifurcation in the injection near field or the training combustion wave in zone one for all the mass flux cases. So when we go from half a pound a second all the way to two pounds per second or 0.2 kilograms per second to one kilogram per second roughly, um, that zone bifurcation exists. It starts to spatially separate, but it's very much a feature only in the injection near field or what we define as zone one. Similar observations have been done by pressure transducer measurements, but there has been a uh, um, very little like uh, 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 support to why we see what we see over there. Uh, so let's you know take this uh, uh, Uran's uh, simulation and kind of you know peel the onion layer and look at what's happening ahead of the detonation wave. Let's let's kind of understand what's happening in the uh, injection near field and far field. So this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I'll try to explain what's going on here. So here is here are two things that we're looking at. So the, the, the first one is the local equivalence ratio. Uh, at 298 Kelvin for hydrogen air, uh, detonability limits have been defined to be around 0.3 to 3. And what we're going to do is do statistical analysis between these 18 degrees of um, R theta. So theta is like 18 degrees wide. R is going to be uh, your, your radial depth at 10.7 millimeters. And we're going to take all of the um, um, local equivalence ratio and plot it as a PDF. When we do that in this in each of these locations, right, at 5, 10 millimeter, 20 millimeter, 30, 40, and 50 millimeters from the fuel injection site, in the near field, you see a bimodal distribution. What that means is your most of your fuel is unmixed, which is this guy right here. Most of your oxidizer is unmixed, which is this guy right here. And there's barely anything that you see, but you still see some periphery of like, you know, detonable mixtures. That's at 10 millimeter, right? And when we go into this zone two definition, which we had in the earlier case at about 30 millimeters for the baseline case that's mentioned here, you start to see after the 30 millimeter case, when the reactant jet goes from supersonic to subsonic, you start to see much more dramatic mixing. So that bimodal distribution starts to like distribute into a more even uh, detonable mixture. So all the uh, spatially, all of this location actually has a much better detonable mixture. And that demarcation is happening exactly at zone one and zone two at about 30 millimeters for the baseline case. That's readily observed here. Uh, so all of this could basically uh, support the hypothesis of why the trailing wave exists in the near field is because of the fact that you have uh, lower mixing and you have static properties. And the last question that we have is, what about wall curvature? Because the wave actually sets off, you know, trailing azimuthal combustion system, uh, trailing azimuthal shock wave. So is that a coupling between what was not burned and that shock wave is the next question we want to answer. So in order to do that, we're going to jump into OH Bliff and try to see what's happening here. Again, OH Bliff, uh, I wanna, th this slide is just an aid. We will actually look at this data in detail. Um, uh, the hydroxyl radical is again used as a, is, as a product gas marker and the OH star chemiluminescence is used as a flame front marker. Uh, these imaging systems are coupled and combined. So at 65 microseconds, the wave has not arrived into the Bliff sheet yet. So it's kind of away from the Bliff sheet. At six microseconds later, the wave starts to touch the PLIF sheet. So you can start to see OH, you know, um, uh, form or like get produced in the PLIF plane at certain locations. And then the wave starts to transition in through that PLIF plane. So you can start to see more OH form. So it's kind of like slicing this azimuth axial structure radially to get you a radial depth information. And as time goes on, um, you know, stuff burns and you get like different OH concentrations and OH fills. So that's why this is simultaneous. This is orthogonal. And this gives you an idea of the three-dimensional detonation wave structure where uh, OH chem gives you X theta and uh, OH plif gives you XR. So here are some key observations. So we can first take a look at the temporal evolution of, evolution of the 3D detonation structure. So I'm just going to let it play twice. So uh, we can we can we can kind of get a sense for the detonation wave as it's passing through that cliff plane, which is marked by the phosphorescence of the glass, right? Uh, so the first thing we see is that there is actually not a lot of contact burning. There is OH in the injection near field, and wherever there is absence of OH, that's where the pro uh, reactants are. Uh, that's what we 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 claimed before. 
And so as the reactants are getting filled, I don't see any OH getting produced. So contact burning is probably not that relevant. And the reason for that is that the ignition time scales for cold reactants coming in are actually two orders of magnitude higher than the wave speed. Uh, we also looked at the shear layer uh, using the URAN simulation, took those temperatures and again computed the ignition delays. Again, they were also like an order of magnitude higher than the wave speed. So before the wave arrives, that has not had enough chemical time for the reactions to start occurring. So there is not a lot of contact burning that we see. The second thing that we don't see necessarily is negligible product gas backflow. So when we're looking at the OH Plif data set, as that product gas moves back into the air plane because of the high pressure impulse, we should be able to see product gas go into the injection stream. But because of the fact that our injectors are very stiff in this particular case, there is negligible product gas backflow. And the third thing is that same actual variation that we saw in just pure OH star chemiluminescence. Uh, we see that in this simultaneous measurement as well. And at about 84 microseconds, the, we have this uh, uh, combustion system, which we're going to call it as azimuth reflected shock combustion system. I'll, 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 I'll explain it as, as we go along in this presentation. Uh, compare this with the URAN simulation, and the reason we want to do this is we want to, you know, every every hypothesis we make, we have to make sure that the URAN simulation is actually capturing uh, the physics quite well, so that we can we can we can understand from a combined experimental numerical approach. With that said, uh, here's here here are some slices of the radial axials as you get through the detonation wave. So we're gonna here's the detonation wave. If I take a slice in this location, this is what the structure looks like. If I take a slice out of the detonation wave in this azimuth location, this is what that structure looks like. And then I've given like time series here, and then that, those times corresponds to the wave speed as it's moving through the plift plane. But we've taken those time steps and actually, you know, cast them as one-to-one uh, -one comparisons between the two structures. As you can see, at the start of the uh, cycle, before the wave arrives to the plift plane, there is OH gas, OH uh, low levels of luminosity, but OH present in the injection near field near the backward facing step, and then OH present in the far field because that's the refill height of the of the combustor. And that's the same case you see here in total temperature. And the reason why we use total temperature is it's it, we want to also track heat release. So we'll we'll, we'll that that'll start to become a key uh, uh, parameter of tracking uh, total temperature. And as time goes on, as the wave is passing through the plif plane, as you're slicing through the plif plane. The reactants are actually consumed, you know, in the directions that the arrows are pointing. So, you know, up this way and back that way. And the waves now passed. Now the waves passed the plift plane, and, the, and then you're now looking behind the detonation wave at like 18 microseconds in the CFT plane. You can start to see that piece the story of what that combustion system in the injection near field is all about. There seems to be an unburned pocket in the injection near field that does not burn. And then that burns almost in a one microsecond fashion. At a, at, 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 at a little time later, about 19 microseconds. And that can also be seen as a total temperature rise. So if the total temperature increases, that's a heat release process. It's not a shock because the shock systems cannot increase uh, the, the, the total temperature. Uh, so then the big question is, why does it exist? Why does the trailing wave exist and what is its nature? So here's a hypothesis that we, that we made before we actually went ahead and uh, tried doing more understanding of what's happening here. So because of the fact that there's low static properties and poor mixing, the injection near field, what we think is happening is not getting consumed in its entirety. We also uh, uh, have this hot product in the recirculation zone, and therefore the detonation waves product gas actually kind of leads ahead in the injection near field. That's observed in the CFT work. And there was a recent work by uh, um, uh, Radulescu's group where they had like product gas here and reactants here, and they set off a detonation. And the wave uh, actually was lagging the pressure front in that in that uh, in the back uh, in product gas. And this is a case very similar to what you have here. Just it's flipped: product gas at the bottom and reactants at the top. In this case, product gas at the top and the reactants at the bottom. Nevertheless. Uh, there is a leading wave curvature in the injection near field. And that detonation wave, what we think is happening is, is actually unable to consume all the reactants. It can consume around the tongues, as you can see, around those fuel jets, but it's not able to consume all the fuel jets or the oxygen. So it's actually pushing all of those reactants behind it. And then uh, in the injection near field, what else is happening is the fact that because of the 
curvature, you start to set off these azimuthal shock systems. So if you look at the radial velocity, it goes from like, you know, pointing up towards the outer wall. There is a shock that points it down towards the inner wall. Again, that's a shock that's actually pointing towards the outer wall. And then there's a last shock that actually points it towards the inner wall. At that last shock location, we also see that that temperature or the total temperature starts to rise. So that is the hypothesis that, that, that we're making that the azimuthal shock system is actually a combustion system that exists in the injection near feed. Uh, what else can we say about the azimuthal reflected shock combustion? The, the, the fact that we actually have luminosity very much close to the uh, injection near field zone one's leading front luminosity starts to really uh, uh, you know, un uh, unravel the mysteries of the fact that the ARSC could indeed be detonative in nature. And in order to be detonated in nature, we have to have a few different uh, um, evidences. So we have some experimental evidence and we have some numerical evidence. Uh, and for, for a shock-induced detonation to exist, uh, there are two conditions that need to be met that was uh, defined by Heiser and Pratt, or uh, Pratt and Humphrey, I believe, sorry. But in any event, uh, so shock should be formed by an external show, source. And in this case, the leading freely propagating detonation wave is the external source that's forming these shocks. And then the second system is that the ARSC needs to be a thin heat release zone. So for both those reasons combined, for the experimentally, we just see that the OH gets consumed in one microsecond. So we did this measurement at two megahertz and it took about half a microsecond to actually consume those reactants. So, so if you think about the wave speed and you think about the fact that this is at a megahertz, so within one microsecond, if, that reactants are, if the reactants are getting consumed, then the heat release zone is very short and very small, it's less than two millimeters. The second observation experimentally is the fact that the ARSC actually has very high luminosity and it kind of competes in the OH chemiluminescence images uh, to the injection near field and the far field. All of this is to say that the heat release occurring in the, in the, in the leading front, which is we know for sure a detonation wave, that level of luminosity is actually observed in the trailing wave as well. Okay, that's what we see in the experiment, but how else can we support this argument? Uh, numerically, we also see that the shock and the flame are coupled with less than two millimeters. The second thing that we see is that the product gas is getting accelerated across that front. Uh, that doesn't seem to happen in the injection far field, as we uh, as we saw in the previous slide. Um, whoops. Yeah, as we saw in the previous slide, where uh, there's there's not a lot of like you know combustion or any high temperature zones in the injection far field. So. Um, yeah, there's 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 total pressure rise, there's total temperature rise across that system, and there is also act flow acceleration. All of this leads to the leads us to believe that that system is indeed a shock induced combustion system. Sure. So who cares? What's the what's the implication? Now, because of the fact that the zone in the injection near field is bifurcated azimuthally, you have a freely propagating detonation front, which causes a pressure rise of four. And you have a trailing detonation front, which is a shock induced detonation front. And using CFT, we saw that that pressure rise is only two. So, what that means is you get a combined pressure rise of eight in the injection near field for this detonation wave. Compared to that, to the far field, where there is just a single leading detonation front, you actually get a pressure rise of 12. So, what that means is azimuth bifurcation can actually lead to lower pressure. Uh, pressure rise. So anytime you have like uh, bifurcations or like multiple waves and stuff, single steep fronted freely propagating wave, you've started to encounter a certain loss mechanism. The second key point or the broad implication is the fact that that's fine. And, but at the very least, the reactants are not getting thrown out of the RDE. They have a chance to mix and burn. So in a way, this is a win-lose situation. You probably want to have it steep fronted and consume as much reactants as you can, but if it doesn't, that's fine. It at least is able to burn in a detonative fashion in azimuth uh, uh, system. So uh, with that key observation and hypothesis, I'm gonna go, uh, let's take a, one last look at this ARSC using OH PLIF and that dual plane OH PLIF measurement that we talked about earlier. So what does that ARC look like in the, in the injection near field and the far field? So uh, here is a CFT image of, I plotted static, I could have plotted total, but in any event, uh, you can kind of see that the combustion zone in the injection near field uh, seems to have uh, the detonation wave kind of close coupled to the outer wall. And then there seems to be a dark zone, uh, which is indicative of like low temperatures. And uh, in the injection far field, 
you see a single steep fronted detonation wave. So in my OH plif, here are all my expectations. First, I should see that the OH plif should lead an injection near field at that combustion zone. The second thing I should see is a combustion zone kind of catches near the outer wall. The third thing I should see over time is that there should be a gap in OH signal in the injection near field. And then the fourth thing I should see is another combustion zone actually at attack those unburned reactants at a later time and actually fill the whole area up with reactants. So here's a megahertz image sequence. So this is the left side is the injection near field at 11 millimeters, right side is the injection far field at 38 millimeters. As we can clearly see, that's the expectation that we have the leading front actually like, you know, uh, propagate through that product gas. So if you think about it, this is 10 millimeters wide. That's about where the reactants are and downstream of that is where the products are. And in this case, it's more or less filled with the entire reactants, but there's still low-level reactants in the inject in in the in the radially uh, uh, but towards the ID. There's a bunch of product gases, so that's what you see here. So the wave leads a little bit there, and then as the wave propagates, there seems to be that combustion zone. There are some spatial non infirmities in the laser sheet, but ignoring that, we're still able to understand a good chunk of the physics. And then as the wave propagates, there's your big pocket of unburned reactants that you see here. I've frozen this frame right here. Uh, it kind of clearly shows what that system looks like. Looks like. Um, I'm going to play that one more time. And so, yeah, ARSC is basically a shock-induced detonation in the injection near field, and that occurs because of uh, two reasons, combined reasons. We haven't been able to isolate and say if it's static properties or mixing. So what are the broad implications of the lesson learns? Just to reiterate, uh, mixing stratifications can cause non-ideal detonations, and detonation can vary along the actual direction. Uh, shear layers in the injection near field can uh, can cause partial premixing and um, um, uh, uh, allow for uh, uh, detonation wave propagation over there, which which is this particular location. Uh, and zone one is relatively low luminous, and you have wave bifurcations. Uh, and then zone two is relatively high luminous, and you don't have that many wave bifurcations. Um, the azimuth shock systems that exist in RDEs uh, can help and mix combust unburned reactants, so we should probably try to make use of it. And uh, mixed mode detonations are, are now prevalent in RDEs, and so that's probably why a significant uh, body of like pressure transducers and like you know uh, TD last measurements are actually able to pick up these multiple spikes. And the leading factors for this azimuthal bifurcation is low static quantities and poor mixing. So I'm going to accelerate a little bit and try to see how we can extend this understanding. So uh, what we wanted to do was, um, OK, let's take the lessons we've learned thus far about actual bifurcations and sorry, about azimuthal bifurcations and ARSC and then actual variations to detonation structure. And let's just change the combustor just a little bit. What we did was we eliminated that backward facing step and then we installed a ramp rather than actually terminating at a backward facing step. What this allows us to do is fully expand the products, not have any total pressure loss in the injection near field. Uh, the expectation is that um, the performance could potentially improve because we don't have a deflagrative combustion zone in the injection near field. And again, the two leading uh, factors that we told uh, earlier for ARSC to be present were low static quantities and poor mixing. And Instantly, when we look at these conditions, so there are there are eight cases here. This is one of the SciTech talks that I gave recently. There are eight cases here. We go from half a pound a second all the way to two pounds per second, half a pound a second to two pounds per second. For all conditions, the backward facing step seems to have a higher wave speed and close to like 80 to 90% CJ compared to that ramp that we saw earlier. There's a significant reduction in the wave speed, and it's you know pretty much underperforming by as much as 17%. Why is that? So that's the big question. So we throw in the quartz outer body, and then we look at the detonation wave, and we immediately start to recognize that the detonation front is no longer a steep fronted detonation wave, but it's just filled with multiple azimuthal combustion systems. As we explained earlier, if you have that, then the wave is not going to be able to propagate close to CJ speeds or like not be as efficient as a single steep fronted wave. And therefore, even though the static quantities are going to be very similar, to that of the that, that of the backward facing step case because it's an under expanded jet for the BFS case. The fact that this geometry uh, uh, actually made the wave worse uh, starts to beg into uh, starts to bring into light the fact that RDEs and combusted dimensions can uh, 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 can lead the combusted dimensions are a highly sensitive uh, a parameter. 
And so, you know, when you're designing a combustor, just making a small change of just, you know, filling up that backward facing step might, you know, make the combustion system worse. What that means is we have job security because, you know, small parameters can make large changes in the detonation wave. So we, we, we still have a long ways to go. All right, so the next part of this talk is, okay, let's eliminate mixing. I want it on this pre-mixed. And so that's what, that's exactly what we did uh, because we still don't know what are all the leading factors for that azimuthal bifurcation. Why do we see an ARSC zone in the injection air feed, right? So right now we have two hypotheses: low static quantities and poor mixing. That's why you have reactant leakage. So we did that. Uh, we wanted to see what the implication of wave bifurcation is. And so we used the exact same geometry we plugged in the, ox the hydrogen system. We mixed hydrogen and air about 10 feet upstream of the air injector to make sure it's well mixed. This is dangerous, but doable. And we also increased the mass flux to one and a, well, 1070 kilograms per meter square per second, which is like one and a half pounds per second or 0.7 kilograms per second. We did that to make sure that the wave is actually, uh, you know, uh, is not anchoring in the injection air field. Uh, we've had dramatic flashback events above F equivalence ratio of 0.86. So, you know, that's that's putting the quartz in danger. So let's 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 keep the equivalence ratio of 0.8 and let's try to see what we see. And this is what the camera sees. And you know, uh, you can you can kind of see that actually there is no like distortion and uh azimuthali only in the extremities you see a distortion. So whatever you see in the in the in the injection uh, in, in these images are kind of true to what that detonation wave looks like. So again, to reiterate, we 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 saw azimuthal bifurcations because of, and, and, then, and then we said that we have two quantities that, that actually uh, are influencing them, which is lower static quantities, as well as two parameters, lower static quantities and poor mixing. And so we eliminate that mixing factor and we run this RDE pre-mixed and we now want to see what happens. And indeed, uh, lo and behold, that ARSC system continues to show up. So um, this starts to, you know, peer into more understanding where probably just not, mixing is, is not the rate limiting factor in, in rotating detonations. Mixing could be heavily influential, but once we run this in a pre-mixed fashion, we don't see uh, 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 any uh, absence of an ARSC in the system. So what that means is that as pre-mixed reactants are getting injected, the low static quantities in the injection air field still leak reactants and actually push it back into the in, uh, into the uh, azimuthal shock system and combusts that as a shock induced detonation. So here's a megahertz image sequence, uh, and then you can kind of see um, you know uh, structurally between the non premix case which is listed here and the premix case which is listed here, there is a larger azimuthal separation of the ARSC, but uh, ARSC still exists. The second thing is um, along the detonation wave, uh, the leading front is not, I'm sorry, the zone one is not as low luminos luminosity as zone two because it's pre-mixed case, the luminosity seems to extend more or less the same, but because of the low static uh, uh, conditions in the injection near field, there is still reactant leakage and that goes behind and burns in the azimuth six system. So yeah, uh, RDs don't, Pre-mixed RDs don't mean single steep fronted wave. There are other systems and other, other factors of physics in play. So uh, the last thing I wanted to point out was the fact that, you know, this is a pre-mixed RD. One would expect this to go close to CJ, but instead we only get like 86% CJ. And that's probably because of reactant slippage in the injection air field, as well as wall curvature and low static properties. All of that said, let's go to the broad conclusions. Um, the physics of RDs are very couple static properties, mixing, product gas reactant interface, wall curvature, and just the geometry itself are all highly sensitive parameters. Uh, we 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 showed that there is a there is a uh, azimuthal shock system called ARSC, which is azimuthal reflected shock combustion. It's a shock induced detonation. It helps combust the unburned reactants detonatively, and has a low pressure rise compared to a freely propagating wave. So, uh, what that means is mix mode. Uh, detonation of freely propagating wave uh, uh, plus a shock induced detonation in the injection near field is what one would observe uh, for this particular geometry or these kinds of geometry. Um, and then um, uh, a freely propagating wave consuming all the reactants is probably the best scenario you're going to get, but that's what we should design towards.
Uh, then we took that understanding, we checked out to see what happens in a ramp, a ramp combustor. Um, that explained to us what how sensitive an RDE can be. So that kind of ensures uh, uh, that we still have a long ways to go before we're able to like actually uh, uh, you know design and, and, and understand these systems. Um, and then the last uh, extension that we did from all of that understanding was we we took this understanding, we went to a premix RDE, and we showed ourselves that first that the premix RDE does not produce a detonation that's very canonical. Uh, uh, the wave only travels at 86% of CJ and mixing is not just the primary, you know, loss mechanism that, uh, that, that we can keep uh, um, uh, accounting for, for most of the loss we see in an RDE. Other things like static property and geometry are probably uh, uh, more important. So, you know, the, the physics is open to explore and uh, anybody is welcome to do that. With that, uh, I'd like to say thank you to Professor Dan Smyer, Professor Slipchenko. Uh, they've 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 guided me throughout my entire PhD, and then a lot of the extension work I've been doing with Teddy and uh, Mikhail, um, and then Professors Guillermo Paniagua and James Ron for uh, helping me with the computational work. I mean, without that, all of this understanding is just like not possible. So thanks a lot to them. Uh, Spectral Energies, uh, the the great crew over there, uh, Dr. Chris Fuger, Dr. Sukesh Roy, Dr. Paul Su, and Dr. Naibar Zhang, all four like great mentors who helped with lasers and like optical parametric oscillators and they kind of helped uh, uh, guide us through getting this RDE up and running as well as doing the measurements. Uh, um, uh, a great thanks to, you know, uh, Doug Perkins at NASA Glenn as well as uh, Dan Paxson, Dr. Dan Paxson at NASA Glenn. Both of them are like uh, tremendous mentors. They kind of like, you know, had a lot of interactions with us uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, helped, un helped uncover a lot of the physics that I explained to you. Uh, and then uh, thanks to the DOE UTSR program for funding a good chunk of this work, uh, as well as a lot of the colleagues and students who've worked over this since like 2019 with us. Uh, so Dr. Zach, Zach Hayes, he's working at Raytheon now, Dr. Jordan Fisher, Austin Webb, Chris Crabtree, and uh, students Baby Wong and Sash Patel. So with that, uh, thank you and brick bats and bouquets. Thank you. That was a, that was a great talk. Um... We can open the floor for questions now. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to type them in the chat or just unmute yourself. Um, and I guess in the meantime, I can I can ask you a couple questions. Um, sure. You talked about this trailing edge and or this trailing combustion wave. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there was ever a time where you would see it not be present, whether it be in the methane air RDE or in like a super lean condition. So, um... In a super lean condition, so, so if you have a stable detonation wave, for the most part, we were able to see this ARSC feature exists. So there's no, uh, uh, there was no two ways about it. Um, but um, yeah, if, if, if in case at super lean conditions, there are a lot of multiple waves spinning around. So there's no, there's no calling one as an ARSC versus the other. This is more a feature of um, um, uh, um, actually uh, ox fed RDEs. Um, if you look at the AFRL version where they have radial air injection, this doesn't seem to exist per se. So uh, it this seems to be a, a, a more of an actual RD system uh, uh, feature. So okay, yeah, and, and uh, maybe I'll reveal even at the rocket conditions we do see this secondary combustion event, like methane oxygen. We see secondary combustion events. So there's no uh, there's no getting around it. Whether it's hydrogen air or methane oxygen, we see this. Okay. Um, and then I guess one other question for you, when you were showing the like mixing, um, I think it was one of the CFD uh -huh. um, overviews you had where you had the distance and the equivalence ratio and the Mach number um, throughout it. I was wondering, so there was a really large jump between the 40 and 50 millimeters for mixing. Um, I was wondering if that changed based on your equivalence ratio or if that changed based on your fueling. Uh, so you're talking about this? Yeah. So what was the, can you repeat the question, sir? Like if the distance that it became mixed, yes. or like mixed changes based on your equivalence ratio, and then how yeah. much does it actually end up changing? So you're asking how does the mixing change? with? Yeah, based on equivalence ratio. Like if you uh, were to go to like 0.9 or like 1.2 or something, would it take uh, longer um, to actually mix? So, uh, not really, because the the actual front or the or, or how far this this extends out is actually a function of the air momentum. So okay. if the air momentum is fixed, then the yeah. supersonic jet to subsonic transition is going to happen at this location for a given air flow rate, whether you change your fuel flow rate or not. 
So yes, mixing changes a little bit, but not as significant as one would expect. It'll just, it, instead of these curves, like, you know, uh, uh, transitioning into this shape at 40 millimeters, it'll probably be something like that. But okay. the transition point yeah. is still a function of the air mass flux, so. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I've got a question. <laughs> Um, I was wondering what uh, what the sound speed or temperature was in the recirculation, but behind the backwards step compared to that in the uh, in the jet or compared to the detonation speed. So in the jet, it's three hundred meters per second. Uh, in the backward facing step, it's about eight hundred nine hundred Kelvin. So I'm just trying to see maybe if I were to guess about five hundred Kelvin. Uh, gotta quickly do the math. Uh, All right, so yeah, about five five fifty Kelvin. So five fifty meters per second. So three hundred meters per second in the injection near field uh, in the reactants, and then at that backward phase, it's about six hundred meters per second. Five fifty to six hundred. Okay. So if the hypothesis is that uh, we have this, you know, this kind of shock behind that backwards facing step. Outrunning yeah. the detonation, uh, it's a bit surprising well, that the detonation speed is probably faster than the sound speed in the. No, that no the, so you're asking about this particular feature, the wave is here and the and the sh and the shock is here. Uh, yes, that's that's so that, yeah. So if you if you look at like for example, you know, in a, this is a premixed straight channel detonation, so they have a spark here, and then they start off a deflagration flame, and then they set off a detonation in the other direction. That's a feature that is observed even in even in a even in a simple straight premix detonation, uh, straight channel detonation. So, uh, I mean, the current hypothesis is the fact that the speed yeah. so, speed of sound is like much higher in this in this particular zone, right? So the pre, the the combustion wave and this guy are pressure coupled, so they don't the separation doesn't increase. They are kind of pressure coupled because uh, the speed of sound is I'm sorry, the 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 pressure here is generated because of the detonation wave. But uh, uh, which is why it's able to propagate further down, but it's not able to outrun the uh, detonation wave because these two are pressure fuel. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we have a question in the chat from Tyler. Um, so he said thank you, and then he was wondering if you explored the impact of the quartz outer body versus the steel outer body on operation. And you said qualitative or quantitative. Um, uh, that's a good question. I mean, so one way in which we could do that is actually look at the uh, wave speeds using exhaust chemiluminescence. And there seems to be no effect because these tests are short, only 300 to 500 milliseconds usually. So uh, there seems to be no thermal effect because of like, you know, thermal soaking or like uh, uh, different adiabatic wall temperature or different conditions. So uh, quantitatively and qualitatively, I don't think there's a huge difference. And we're able to compare one to one a lot of the features, you know, with the pressure transducer and the chemiluminescence, we're able to compare features one to one. So, so the goal is, our hope is that that doesn't necessarily uh, affect the detonation wave. And another thing that we were able to do recently was uh, we incorporated an optical center body. So we were able to actually have a metal outer body and then an optical center body to look at the detonation wave structure at very similar operating conditions. When we looked at the detonation wave through the inside it still looks the same. So morphology wise, again, uh, wave speeds, all of that remain the same. So, so yeah, uh, there is no difference between the quartz and the steel on operation, as far as we could tell. Thank you. Um, okay, and then do we have any other questions from anyone? Uh, I have a question, uh, I have a uh, huh? curiosity question. I'm sure. just wondering if your uh, injection holes injectors are yeah. along the other side of the annular chamber, which yeah. right now in the picture you show they are on the, I would say, concave side, right? Yes, yeah. And what would be the effect if you place them on the convex side, which seems like the other, the opposite side would try to, uh, you know, reflect this... Uh, this shock wave maybe uh, closer towards the combustion front. 
Is so that the haste, the, the combustion. Uh, this is again an extrapolation. This is not my experiment, but I've seen work like from mm -hmm. a, a Zucro where they actually have uh, similar uh, contraction, but then fuel comes from the outer wall. And mm -hmm. even in those cases, I've heard uh, again, this is just uh, uh, I've not seen the data, but I've only heard that they mm -hmm. do see bifurcations in the azimuth direction. So, uh, so it exists, uh, but I don't have any data to show that it exists yet. So, okay. But that's an interesting question. We uh, we had to pick this geometry for optical access purposes, but that's a, that's an interesting question that we'll eventually explore. Yeah. And the further question, uh, maybe also like a extrapolation or a speculation type of a question is: uh, Do you think eventually we should use cylindrical or annular chamber, or maybe a straight channel? Just let the let the detonation of flapping uh, back and forth in in a, in a rectangular channel will be better. So, um, first rectangular channel. So you're talking about a reflecting shuttling detonation wave. Yeah. Um, so the reflecting shuttling detonation wave still doesn't travel at CJ. So we're still we're still very close to what you get in an RD first. Mm -hmm. Second, because of the fact that you don't have azimuthal shock combustion, you basically lose out on that ability to burn those unburned reactants in a detonative fashion. Mm. This, so I, this yeah, I mean more like a channel that uh, is like RDE, but you unwrap it. You I know. Yeah. Like a uh, injection on one side, but you you have this uh, uh, shock wave uh, flapping back and forth, uh, being reflected on two rigid walls. I think if you make this uh, channel thin enough or the the, the longitudinal mm -hmm. um, distance uh, small enough, uh, the frequency of the sh uh, detonation wave passing through your um, you know slowly burning reactant could be similar to that in the RDE. Right, but you eliminate all these wall uh, curvature effects. Yeah, uh, it, that's that's what I'm saying. It, that is mm -hmm. the the if if you have it if, if this was a straight channel, yeah. these shocks won't exist. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. And so actually, you will still have the variations in the detonation structure, but uh, the these shocks won't exist. What that means is if the if the first contact of a detonation does not burn through the reactants mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then those reactants have passed the detonation and now they've left actually outward so you're throwing away reactants but okay. in this case because of the uh, curved confinement you're kind of capturing them back again and again shock heating okay. them and burning them again so you actually have an advantage okay. from a curved surface which you lose if you just go through a straight channel so reflecting shuttling detonations are cool but uh, mm -hmm. uh the question is, does these azimuth shock systems actually have an impact on, on the broader performance? So that's still mm -hmm. kind of yet to be answered, but just on the outlook, uh, mm -hmm. you at least give these reactants a chance to burn. Yeah. You won't give the reactants in the other case any chance to burn. So, mm -hmm. But do you think like without this wall uh, curvature effect, the, the, the first leading shock would be uh, even stronger, that it can more efficiently burn the reactant in the first shot or that is uh, somehow not possible that's not actually possible at all because mm -hmm. if you think about it in the injection near field you're unmixed mm -hmm. and then the mixing starts to improve as you go far field so okay. that stratification is going to exist whatever happens right so mm -hmm. it's only a matter of trying to um, uh, burn through some of it and then burn through them again Whereas mm -hmm. in the case of an actual system, if this is what the wave sees, it will burn around it and go away and it'll actually not burn the fuel or the oxygen throw all of that out in a reflecting mm -hmm. shuttle detonation. So, so there's no way around it you, unless it's a premix system. Right. So if it's a premix system, probably, but premix has its own set of challenges, flashback and mm -hmm. flame holding in the wrong location. Right, right. So. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah, Thank that's you. a great question. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I think we have one more question or a couple more questions. We have one from the chat. Um, Robert Burke has a question, so I'll, I'll let him unmute and ask his question, and then there's a question after that. Yep. Uh, I, we can't hear you, Robert, if you're speaking. Hi, yes, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep, yep. 
Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was, it was very interesting. Um, I, I had two questions. The first one was, did you find if the distance between the primary detonation front and the uh, following uh, ARSC ever change? Yes, here at different mass flux, they change. Okay. The I, uh, yes, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. I see, I see. And um, uh, do you... even on the premix versus non-premix, they change quite a bit. Okay, and that was all dependent on the on the mass? This is at the same mass flux. Sorry, I forgot to mention. Same mass flux. This is phi of one. This is phi of 0. 0.8, but, you know. It was different. Okay. It's pre mixed, so. Okay. Uh, do you think then that, uh, so you, you're mentioning this change based on, on the mass flow, but uh, do you think also that distance could depend on the, the curvature or the geometry of the backward facing step? Absolutely. So the, yes, in, indeed, that's the, that's the whole point of this, uh, this RAM case uh, yes it, it 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 heavily depends on the geometry and the curvature so at, at the very least the geometry effects are shown here and uh if you go a uh, 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 smaller or a larger curvature uh, there is a paper by Zhao and Wang uh which I showed in the um introduction slide uh this this work behind here um mm -hmm. and so they kind of change the channel gap widths and uh that actually shows these reflected shocks actually uh you know uh, become smaller and larger. So when they go to like a critical channel gap of around three millimeters, I believe, uh, they actually lose the azimuth shock system completely. Uh, so uh, that's in a premix system. So obviously there are there are other effects, but yes, that it does have an influence. So okay. that's a channel okay. gap question, but then you can also think about it in terms of curvature. It, it'll have a similar effect. Okay. And, and my final question is, um, I know that What's going on in the combustor can change pretty pretty drastically with the addition of some type of choke further downstream, which introduces mm -hmm. some back pressure into the combustor. Do you think that would also change anything, with, uh, even with the backward facing step configuration? Great question. So uh, yes, we've seen uh, two things happen. So we we've, we've put a turbine on this or a, or a st state of veins on this that increased mm -hmm. the local. Um, I mean that increased the static pressure in the chamber. And what ended up happening there was uh, the wave started to get a little bit tighter because the mean pressure increased, but we still saw this ARC. And then we've actually put on a choke blade where it chokes to an area ratio of around, so this is one, uh, this is about three. So, so basically it, it, it's about area ratio 3.5. So half of this channel was choked. Mm -hmm. In that case, the mean chamber pressure went up pretty high, like two X times roughly, because the chamber is like seven and the other one's like three. And when mm -hmm. that happened, uh, the wave actually split off into two detonation waves rather than one. So we had other modes like slapping modes and, and various other modes that started to like show up. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, imaging data to kind of give an idea of what that structure looks like, but at least in the injection near field, in the pressure transducer traces, uh, as I mentioned before, we actually see uh, two peaks in the injection near field and then one in the far field. So, okay. so this, this profile seems to have been maintained. So, Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And then there was a question, uh, another question you said, Michelle? Yeah, they were just, um, someone was asking you to comment on the thickness of the quartz for the plus. Ah, uh, so the quartz was uh, uh, 0.88 inches thick. So it's about 20 millimeters, roughly. Okay. Uh, so this is an our combustion flame paper. The details are there if, if you want to uh, have a look at it. So. Um, and then I had a follow up question to one of Robert's questions. Was there an ideal distance or is there like an ideal distance for how far that reflective shock wave would be from the initial detonation wave? Like, or does it make a difference as long as it's present? I think it's fun. Uh, so is your question uh, which of whether this is more efficient or uh, something like this is more efficient? Um. So I, I believe you mentioned the, the step being more efficient, but in that step, is there like a more ideal distance between them? Or does uh, it not matter? I don't have an answer for that question. I don't know. I, I can only tell you that this has more bifurcations in the okay. ramp case, as opposed to the backward facing step. As it has more bifurcations, the pressure gain is now from leading steep fronted to multiple shock induced detonations. Uh, as opposed to this case where it's largely steep fronted and one shock induced detonation. This is a little better than the other one. 
just yeah. observing slightly, but I don't have a computer, like performance wise, I don't have numbers to back out one is better than the other. Okay. Um, okay. And then does anyone else have any more questions? Okay. Um, then, yeah. Uh, there is one in the chat. Uh, after the one on court. Uh, yeah, we have a question from uh, Winky Fan. Yeah. And he asks, or they ask, uh, first they say it's an excellent talk, and then they uh, ask whether the injection recovery characteristics of air and H2 are with each other, whether they will impact the conclusion of the ARSC. So uh, great question. Um, so we designed the RD in such a way that the plenum pressures are going to be the same. Uh, so, you know, both the uh, the air plenum and the fuel plenum are very close to 5 bar, like 4.9, and the other one's like 5.1. Uh, but indeed, there is actually fuel recovery that ha ha occurs before the uh, air plenum starts to recover. And that is what pops up as this extra rich, you know, reactant downstream, further downstream. But if you think about it, the ARSC feature is more... Uh, uh, um, uh, dominant and like and functionally dependent on how the fuel air distribution happens in the injection air field. These two can recover at different times, but once it reaches steady state, how does that reactant field set itself? And that's what influences where the ARSC sits. Yes, you are throwing a little bit of reactants further downstream, but you know uh, that is not influencing necessarily uh, the conclusions of ARSC. ARSC is a function of how your reactant field sets up as you design this combustor. So, so we're only looking at the injection near field and far field right before the wave arrives, because all of this extra fuel recovery that happened will happen right after the wave passes. The first thing that happens is the fuel recovers, then the ox recovers, and then they finally reach steady state. It's that steady state uh, uh, reactant fill that actually influences how the ARSC looks and behaves. So. Okay, uh, thank you on behalf of Funky Fan. Okay, if there are no other questions, um, then thank you everyone for coming and thank you, Vincat, for speaking. And then um, there'll be another talk, one more talk next week, um, and that'll be the final talk of the season. Um, but yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vincat, for your talk. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you, Vincat. Right. Thanks.